Welcome to another I Grow Season at APC. We're so glad you've tuned in. Our church is blessed with excellent teachers of the Word of God, and our hope is that you find today's teaching enlightening, motivational, and encouraging. To learn more about our church, visit theapc.org or find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So sit back, relax, and enjoy today's lesson. So I want you to write down on your little notes, your little note app on your phone, um, so you can name five weaknesses you think King David had and five, what was it, strengths you think King David had. I've got some down, okay, that I found in Scripture. So just while while you're listening to this first um, um, part of King David, um, we're going to do his ancestry and and some of his family life. Um, Name some of those, and I just want to ask you guys. um, Let me scroll through here. If a couple people wouldn't mind maybe reading a Scripture, it's like a couple verses. If anybody wants to read 2 Samuel 7, 8-17. through I know that's more than a couple of verses, but it's not very much. I got it. Okay, thank you, thank you. And then if someone else will read 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. And I think, and then 2 Samuel 16, 5 through 13. Those are the only ones, I believe. What was the second one? Uh, the second one was, I think it was in Kings. 1 Kings chapter 2, 11 through 12. 1 Samuel 7, what? <laughs> so hold on. Yes, yeah, she did. I'm. I'm. Well, I had it. Hold on. My eyesight. There we go. Second Samuel chapter seven, verses eight through seventeen. And then brother Neil's got First Kings. And then sister Erica, would you read? Huh? Yeah, say it again. I'm looking it up. Oh, for you. Yeah. First Kings, uh-huh. chapter two, verses eleven through twelve. We good. <laughs> and then, uh, Sister Erica, if you could find Second Samuel chapter sixteen, verses five through thirteen. So, so you know, I wanted to go so big with this, brother Brad. I wa- I wanted to have Goliath in here. I looked at trying to get a, like a life size Gol- Goliath, and uh, it's four hundred dollars on Amazon. And I was like, no thanks. Even on Prime Day. Yeah, yeah. $400 on... I was like, this is... I'm not going to get no investment on this, Brother Amal. I'm not going to get no... Ev- Do what? Yeah, brother Calvin, yeah. So, and, and I was going to use Brother Keegan, too, but that kid's working on the toddler room for me tonight, so I don't have to, and so I, I appreciate him doing that. I wish he was in class, but him and his dad are working on that, so... Uh, and I was going to use him as David, and I remember as a kid, I went to this Baptist church for VBS... And it was uh, Walnut Street Baptist Church, I think. Because we go by it to go by Walmart when we're back home in my hometown. And it's this huge brick church up on a hill, but it's right next to the interstate now. And they had these life-size um, Goliath. This dude was on stilts. He was like a drywaller, but he was on stilts. And he was a, he was a big man. And, uh, of course, they made his stilts look like legs. And we had these long tube stalks. Two socks, brother. Brother Ummel. We wrote our name on the neck of them. You know, they come all up to the knee. We put a tennis ball in there, and that was our that was our slingshot. <laughs> and our whole goal was, as ten year olds, nine year olds, get that thing wound up and let go, so we could hit that guy in the head. And uh, I missed every time, so it went way over his head and went way off into the hill. So. Uh... Second Samuel what? Oh jeez. Second Samuel seven. Second Samuel chapter sixteen verses five through thirteen, and then Brother Neil is First Kings chapter two verses eleven through twelve, and then Brother Gramad, Brother Johnson is Second Samuel chapter seven verses eight through seventeen. So I didn't get to do anything that I wanted to do, so I tried to make this as interactive as I could. I just didn't dress up as David. So I thought that would have been fun dressing up as a king. So <clears throat> tonight we're going to learn about David and the meaning behind his name as beloved. So the ancestry and family life. Uh, David was born sometime around 1040 BC. And um, 
they said when I was looking this up, they said this day is likely reached by tracking the back, uh, tracking back the kings of Judah and Israel from their country's respective exiles to uh, Assyria and Babylonian. So uh, at 727 BC and between 597 BC, David was eight, eighth son of Jesse. Uh, in Ruth chapter four. Um, halfway down through that chapter, it, we learn that Jesse was the grandchild of Boaz and Ruth, making David, Ruth, and Boaz's great-grandson. And when I read that story, it's just one of my least favorite stories in the book. It's just not something that I'm attracted to in the Bible. And so I went back and read it again today, and I was like, I, he really is a great-grandson. How did I not know that? How, did I, how many times have I heard this preached, you know, just just, just through, a, you know, 20 years of living for the Lord and and I'm just I'm, I'm studying this. And I'm like, all right, well, he was. So that would mean that the story of Ruth takes place near the end of the time of the judges, from the earliest days of David's life until his final words to his son Solomon. King David had a very significant place in history, um, and that's typically found in First Samuel and First Kings. He was born to his parents in Bethlehem, but despite his humbling. Uh, beginning, even his father was to play a significant role in history. It was his father, Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that was named by God as the person that Samuel should see to find the new king of Israel that God had provided. While there, Jesse waited obediently while God directed Samuel to the young shepherd boy. And David was one to anoint as king. Could you imagine being a child and you're going to be anointed as king? I wish that every day when I was a kid that someone would roll up and be like, you are the heir of some prince. And I would just be like, ah, that never happened. So, but it was through David that the earthly kingship of Jesus began. In Matthew 1 and 1 through 17, we find that uh, we see an incomplete ancestry lineage of Christ from Abraham through David to Jesus' adopted father. Joseph, who was married to Mary. It is notable that his lineage of the kingship of David was passed down from David's son Solomon down through the generations of, um, and I'm probably going to butcher some of these names. Because when I was looking all this up, I was like, oh man, I got to say that. Uh, Silithia, is that how you say it? Because I know you were studying for your dissertation. And, uh, and then and it listed as the son of Jechononis. Close enough. That's exactly right. Okay, that's what we're going to go through. And it's in Matthew 1 and 12, okay? So, so Brad, look it up later and see if you can see that too, okay? So, however, okay, we're going to call him Jack, okay, because I can't say his name. However, Jack was cursed by God for his wickedness so that none of his biological sons or descendants would rule as king. This is found in Jeremiah 22. Therefore, the kingship of David to Jesus was transferred from David's son Solomon to his son Nathan, that is a name I can say, because Solomon... We'll just call him Sam or Sal. Sal was a biological descendant of Nathan. His name was listed as the son of Jack, not because of biology, but because of royalty. Man, how cool would that be, just because you're, you're, you're royalty. But if you track the descendants of, of, of Sal and Jack, you'll find that his lineage continues to Jesus' mother, Mary. And this can be seen by comparing Matthew 1, uh, 6-12 with Luke 3, 27-31. So likewise... If you continue the track, uh, the lineage that was cut off, and I've got some notes here that I wrote down. Um, Matthew, it carries through Joseph, the husband of Mary. This lineage from David was cut off also shows us that Jesus received his earthly kingship through David, his mother Mary, not Joseph, because of this. If you continue to track Mary's lineage back through Nathan, it continues through Abraham all the way to Adam, who is also listed the Son of God. Therefore, David, through David, Jesus inherited his humanity, which is why he could be listed as the son of David and the son of Abraham and the second Adam. That's a lot. I remember on a Black Friday, we were at Christian Lifeway Bookstore in Jonesboro, Arkansas, and we found they were selling these posters for Black Friday, the lineage of Jesus. That would have been so much easier for me to say, here, here it is. And it was this huge, massive poster. And we should have bought one. We should have, they had one for the Bible from the beginning. And then all the major events happened in the Bible. And then, of course, they, you know, they put the, the uh, what was it, the end of the uh, age type uh, um, 
last day's prophecy. They they put that timeline there too, and that, that was pretty neat. <clears throat> so it was, it was cool to see. But uh, man, that just sounded like that was really confusing. So, but when and where he lived, David's hometown was the city of Bethlehem, Luke 2 4. This was later called the city of David, named after the town's most famous historical figure and resident. David lived not long after the end of the period of the judges. That was one of the darkest times in Israel's history, as people did whatever they pleased. Kind of sounds like now, doesn't it? There was no government, which that's what we got, but no, no, law, no rule of law, and people rebelled against the Lord. Before Saul, Israel was a loose federation of tribes. Sometimes they helped reach others, uh, reach other, uh, helped each other, sorry, and worked together, and sometimes they didn't. Uh, so it sounds like they, it was like a love-hate relationship they had going on. And at times, they also had civil wars. Under Saul, the tribes were united and became the kingdom of Israel. So, just to kind of summarize that little part. So the events surrounding his birth, unknown. There was no major events that was happening when he was born. Okay, Training and occupation, goose egg. I couldn't find anything where he got any kind of training. Okay, When he killed, when he killed Goliath... Nothing where he found training. He just been a shepherd boy. He didn't have an occupation, except he was a shepherd out in the field. But he was a shepherd. He was a musician and an armor bearer in 1 Samuel. He was a shepherd in 1 Samuel. Uh, he was a general in 1 Samuel, but then he was a king in 2 Samuel, chapters 4 or chapters 2 and, and, and 5. So <clears throat> place in history. Okay, I think this is this is you, Brother Jonathan. Could you read that real quick? 8 through 17. 1 Samuel. Chapter 7, 7 verse 8 17. Okay. Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused that thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days are be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for the, my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So David is mentioned 983 times. That is, that is unique. That's a lot. He was the second and most beloved king in, in Israel's history. David was one of several individuals God made a special covenant with. And right there, what we just read, the covenant God made with David and his descendants, descendants is seen in 2 Samuel 7 in the scriptures that Brother Jonathan just read. Um, and is referred to as the David covenant. The key features being God's continual protection of David, being like a father to him and preserving his kingly line throughout history. So 40 chapters in 1 Samuel through 1 Kings deals with David and many more in Chronicles and Kings give one more look at David's life. These chapters are filled with rich and in-depth narrative about David's life, both his weaknesses and strengths. That's where we're going to find our answers at here in a second. This is roughly the same amount of material as covered uh, the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Clearly God had inspired his record because there are many lessons we can learn from David's life about both people and about God. So, <clears throat> Now, I asked y'all about the weaknesses and the strengths. Let me ask you an extra question while y'all are still thinking. What good special trait do you think David had? Either as a boy or as a king, as an old man, doesn't matter. What? Submission to authority. 
Submission to authority, a special trait. Takes part of a special person, I guess. Humble. Humble. Wasn't afraid. How about a good musician? Yep, that's what I put. He was, he was a, he was a special writer. trait. All right. Writer. So how about some five weaknesses? You don't have to say your five weaknesses. But I, that's, why I, that's why I wanted you to write it down the phone, just so you can compare your weaknesses to, to his. Because um, there's kind of, a, kind of a cool concept here. How about five weaknesses? Anyone think of five weaknesses David had? Yeah, just go ahead and shout it out. Uh, well, he thought he was greater than God. Thought he was greater than God. So he had a little bit of Lucifer in him. Yeah. Okay. A sword. He was a bloody man. Bloody man. And not somewhat high regard for human life. Uh, and he did have some idols. Did have some idols. Okay. Anybody else? He could be impulsive at times. Impulsive? See, we got the doctors there here speaking right now. <laughs> impulsive. Anything else? How about just one, one words? There you go. Hope no one else is in there. We can't compare ourselves to that, okay? How about a murderer, a poor father in 1 Kings. He was pried by uh, ordering a census. Uh, he didn't check and he punished Joab. He was too quick to judge. He lacked uh, discernment. Those are probably some of his biggest weaknesses. How about strength? What's some strengths that David had? He loved God. Say again? He loved God. He loved God. I actually don't have that on here. <laughs> he was repentant. I do have it somewhere else. Do what? He was repentant. He was repentant. He was very repentant. He was a true worshiper of God. He was a very true worshiper of God. Yes. And I don't think there's really a wrong answer. Come on, Brad. Sh sh throw me one. And I'll throw one back. You got nothing? How about he had faith? He was bold. To walk out as a kid... 10 to 12 years old, however old he was, and faced some nine-foot dude who had always fought in battle. Okay? Chose five smooth stones from the brook. So it sounds like it just took one stone. Kid slung it up there and hit him in the head. And you know that you read, and as a kid, I never knew this, right? Then I get to Bible college and I start reading, start studying. Then he walked over and chopped that dude's head off with a sword. Man, as a kid doing that, that wasn't a grown man. Wow, I just, it was just weird. But uh, he had compassion. He had respect for authority, even though he would abuse that authority too. Yeah. You know, um, and there were set, and there were several places for that. First Samuel twenty four, First Samuel twenty six, First Samuel one, uh, or no, no uh, yeah, and then Second um, Samuel four, where he had respect for authority. He was repentant. Uh, he was humble. He had humility in Psalms eighty six. Talks about his humility. He had prayer and praise in Psalm 17 and 2 Samuel 27 and really the rest of Psalms. Um, he had a little bit of self-control. Sometimes not so much, but sometimes he had self-control, right? Had so, um, say again? He had, he had vision. He had, he, he, had, he had vision. But then I, I think Brother almost said it right. He loved God. And he was a man after God's own heart. So, um, 1 Kings chapter 2, Brother Neil. The days that David reigned uh, over Israel were 40 years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and 30 and three years he reigned he in Jerusalem. Then sat Solomon upon the throne of David's father, and his kingdom was established greatly. He died of old age, 70 years. He, he reigned for about 40 years, if, if, and if he did reign 40 years. Um, Died of old age. So lessons from his life since he had died. When I was reading all this, and I was reading his weaknesses, and I was reading his strengths, I was like, wow, David's, David's a messed up individual. <laughs> hey, like, wow, like, Job went through all of that, right? Job went through all of that, and he wasn't even a messed up dude. But then we see David, and David's after, a man, God, he's after God's own heart. Like, what in the world? Why couldn't Job been named that? And uh, how did Job make it into the list of the faithful in Hebrews 11? That's an open question. Anyone can answer. There's no wrong answers in this class. How did this guy make it into the faith of Hebrews 11? Right? Talking David, David? Yeah, David, yeah. 
Oh, did I say Job? I meant David. Sorry for the correction. Man, see, if Jessica can fix that. How did David make it? Not Job, sorry. But how did but some, but someone like Job didn't get mentioned? Go ahead. David's repentance. He really repented. David's repentance. Repentance is so important, so vital. Because, you know, we sometimes we act like David. We, Man, you know, we could not respect authority sometimes. Like, well, that cop's not going to tell me not to speed ever again. If I'm late, I'm just going to go fast, you know, or just whatever. When we look at some things, he did include murder and adultery. And it could be hard to understand um, why in the world was he in this list. But God forgives sinners. David was a sinner. When you consider the New Testament passages stating that hating someone in your heart is like murder to God and lusting after a woman in your heart is like adultery. And we can see that all, well, uh, we can see that we are all like David, sinners before God. Because of David's public position, his weakness was aired out like dirty laundry for everyone to see. The whole kingdom knew when he had a bad attitude. It was like that thing just reverberated through the land. And... Um, <clears throat> Time and time again, we learn as we go through this list that God forgives and he can continue to forgive David. Now, there was consequences, though. Remember that first child he had with Bathsheba? Kid didn't make it. Why? Because of their sin. Man, can you imagine? But do, uh, oh, sorry, each is on it because, oh, sorry, I completely missed that. Not one of these characters can deserves to be on that list because of their own merit in Hebrews 11. It's, each is on it because God imputed righteousness to them as a result of their faith in Him. So, praying that one day that's all of us too. We all have that same opportunity because we're all repented, born again Christians. Number two is something that we can learn from David is do not let ministry or work keep you from paying attention to your family. That was a very busy king. David was certainly a busy man. He was the general of his own country's army. It was up to him to decide whether or not to go to war or prepare for the war or, and strategize. Now, as a kid watching war movies, you know, the old war movies where it was like, you know, you had this king, but this king always, always had this general and that general and this general and that general. And then, and then this public person and that person like they, it was always like a, it was always like a, a room full of people. It sounds like David made all the decisions. He was the guy like he was the George Washington. He was a president and he was a general. He was the guy. And he was on the front line. <clears throat> he was busy. It was up here to him to decide, you know, what was going on. He was the top judge in the land. People from far away would bring their disputes to him and ask him to settle it. Could you imagine being the general of the army? You're the king. You're a dad. And you still got people coming to you complaining about so-and-so stole my garden or stole my goat. You know, or took some of my sheep. Settle this. He had responsibilities. Unfortunately, it seems that these responsibilities came with became his priority. David was certainly rich enough that he could have hired a number of babysitters, nurses, tutors, or educators for his children to get to the top education in the land. I mean, my goodness, he could have hired me. Okay, I'd have done it. But these things are not a replacement for a dedicated father. First Kings chapter one, um, six. In 2 Samuel 13, 21, that's what it talks about right there. David apparently spoiled his children, children, giving them whatever they wanted. When they had conflicts or sinned, it seems he swept it under the rug and ignored it instead of dealing with it. Like in the case of Amnon. Should have dealt with it. You might think that his kids would grow up loving their daddy who gave them everything they wanted, but this wasn't the case. Absalom, for example, rebelled against David. Another son, um, I'm not even going to try to, well, I will try to pronounce his name. And it's not Adonai, it's, it's a A-D-O-N-I-J-A-H. Adonijah. Adonijah. Man, wish I thought of that. Tried to upsurp the kingdom as well. It seems that some of David's children grew up resenting him, and they were the king's kid. And this reveals a major flaw in the world's logic. Growing up as a king's kid, and you're going to resent your dad, the most powerful man in the country, most powerful man in the land, and you're going to grow up resenting him because he never showed you 10 minutes of, of just one-on-one -on -one time. 2 Samuel, Sister Erica, verse 16, or no, chapter 16, sorry, verses 5 through 13.
And when King David came to Barum, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei. Thank you. <laughs> Shimei. I'll just give you the difficult words. Here we go. The son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came, and he cast stones at David, and at that the, ser the servants of King David, and all of the people and all of the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out. Thou bloody man, and thou man of the lie. The Lord hath returned upon thee all of the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. And said Abishai. Yeah, Abishai. The son of Zerah, Zerah, yeah. unto the king, why should thou, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zerah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shalt thou then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all of his servants, Behold my son, which came forth of my vows, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do I? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. And it may be that the Lord will look upon mine affliction, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. Last verse. And as David and his men went, went by the way, Simei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. <laughs> good job. I'm glad y'all are reading this because I was reading some of the stuff. I was like, man, these are some difficult names. But another thing that we can learn from David is endure troublemakers and annoying people with patience. Well, that is easier said than done. Ain't that right, Brother Elmo? <laughs> man, David was the king of the country and this guy was cursing him. This type of attitude, was, I mean, that's like today, right? President of the United States and people just, just say all kinds of just ugly, nasty things about it, regardless of what party you're from. I mean, and I was even watching a video today of the Canadians. They were having some kind of thing here recently, and they were just, they were just saying just some really, they weren't cursing or anything, but they were just the sarcasm flying and just the accusations. I was like, wow, there is just no more love in this world. It is just gone to the wayside. But David did not allow, or this type of attitude was punishable by death, okay? Abishai wanted to kill him, but David did not allow anyone to punish Shimei. Why? He realized that God is sovereign. He realized that God may have sent this person to curse him, and he realized that God was watching his response and might reward him for responding in kindness with self-control. Could you imagine someone coming up to you, Brad, and just start just giving you the what for? And you stop to think, God's watching. <laughs> Wait a second, before I respond, God's watching. <laughs> I mean, Brother Ummel, I mean, you know, we're big NASCAR fans. You get spun out, and you don't know what's going on. And you're like, hey, fine, I got this car. God's watching me. I've already given this guy some, some kindness. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and, this, this, and this wasn't modern day. I mean, this is Old Testament stuff, you know. And so um, this was not a time when David would have been a good or in a forgiving mood. Okay? He was fleeing from Jerusalem because his, his son revolted against him. He had every fleshly excuse to respond to Shimei in kind, but he restrained himself. This is much like Jesus who endured the lies of false accusations of the Jews without responding. So a lot of foreshadowing here. The fourth thing that we can learn, why that's a typo, 
Everyone needs to listen to the counsel, even kings. We could all listen to some kind of counsel. Ain't that right, Brother Neil? All of us. Even Brother Aaron, every day. 2 Samuel 19. In this case, David's emotions were blinding him to very serious situation around him. He loved Absalom deeply and his soul was grieved to know that he had died and that he died without a relationship with the Lord. David has gone through the same things a lot of people in this world are going through today. Their children pass away. They don't know the Lord. He's committed adultery. He's committed murder. And man, this guy's not in jail. I mean, how in the world, brother, did he not end up in jail? I mean, nowadays, man, you're paying child support. You're in jail. I mean, you're, you know, it's people's kids pass away before they do. And man, I mean, this guy, whew, I mean, the Lord was really, it showed him a lot of mercy and grace. But David's, um, but there, I mean, there's nothing worse though than what David had to go through losing a child like that. But David's strong emotions prevented him from seeing that his followers were going to leave him because of his attitude. David was not objective and not thinking clearly or looking at this clearly. That is very understandable. Okay, I think I, I, think I would have been, man, it's just what he's been through. Okay, and being a king, I can't imagine having all that responsibility, but then dealing with all this stuff as well. And that is why it's so important that someone whom he trusted come alongside him and tell him to wake up. Get your act together. Okay? Stop acting like this. Cut it out, Jonathan. Okay? Just stop it. <laughs> but Joab gave wise counsel. Okay? In this case, David didn't even ask for it. Sometimes that's the best, Mr. Eric. Okay? Even when I want to ask for it, just give me some wise counsel. Okay? Because he needed it. To David's credit, he listened and followed Joab's advice. The fifth thing that we could learn, <clears throat> like brother, um, actually, and I'll read this one. Just like brother almost said, David was a man after God's own art. He loved God. So I'm going to read Acts 13 and verse 22. If I can find it real quick. Got it. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So Brother Amal, if I could love God and be, and be a Christian, being a born again who's after, his own, after God's heart, I have a chance to fulfill all of God's will for my life. He was a murderer. He was an adulterer. But David was a sinner. We all are. However, his heart was pointed towards God always. So he had faith. That's how, that's how he did this. He had faith, 1 Samuel 17. Love for God's law in Psalms 119. He was thankful in Psalms 26. And he was repentant in Psalms 51. So, just because I don't like being long... Final thoughts on King David's godly characteristics, okay? King David is probably the most known for defeating the giant Goliath. And as a kid, and I think even as a new convert when I first got into church, that's all I ever knew. I knew he became a king. That's pretty much it. I knew he beat this real tall guy, and then he became a king later on. And I was thinking that maybe he probably, the Goliath was, probably was that king that he defeated, and he just like took his place. No, well, I was way wrong. But his courage and trust in God as a young shepherd boy prepared him to be the king of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, we see the tender, gentle, compassionate side of this warrior and king. As we look, um, we'll look at four quality uh, uh, characteristics of, of David, a man after God's own heart. So the first one, David was kind and his kindness came from the heart of God. David did not have kindness of his own to show the house of Saul. Saul had chased David and made his life miserable. Instead, it was the kindness of God that he wanted to give away. In verse 3, it says, And they're, still, they're not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him. We are to be instruments of God's kindness. While we are sinners and do not deserve the kindness of God, Jesus died for us. And so now we have received His kindness. We can give it away. 
Like that song says, give it away. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. <clears throat> I had to do some kind of children's ministry in there somewhere. Kindness is the fruit of the Spirit. And even when others mistreat us, God will enable us to be kind through His Holy Spirit. Number two, David kept his promise, just like Jesus keeps all of his promises to us. In 1 Samuel uh, 18 and 20, David had promised Jonathan that he would not cut off his love from the house of Saul once Jonathan was gone. And so David was a covenant-keeping man. And in verse 7 it says, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. We need to be a keeper of our word. When we make a promise, even if it's difficult to keep, we should follow through on our word. When you say, Pastor, I'm going to remodel this toddler room before you get home. You know what? I need to finish that toddler room before he gets home. I only got a couple more days. <laughs> the Bible is filled with God's promises to us. And I am so thankful that God never changes. He's, he, he always does what he says he will do. We can trust Jesus because he is a covenant-keeping God. Third, David showed grace just as Jesus has given us grace. And um, Brother Jonathan, I can use the help for this name. <clears throat> I've been trying to pronounce it all day because I read my notes. I was trying to make sure everything's grammatically correct. And I was like, Man. huh? Yes. Look at that. See, he knew. That man's anointed. I'm telling you. Mephibosheth. Well, you said it for me. When? Mephibosheth. Arrived before David's throne. <laughs> he was scared. He knew that David had the power to put him to death. But David removed all of his fears. He not only gave him life, but he promised to restore the land of Saul to him and let him eat at the king's table forever. That is awesome. Verse 7. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of his Saul father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he, David gave... An abundant life, just as Jesus has given us an abundant life. David was busy. This is number four, sorry. <clears throat> he didn't really need another task to do. Okay, he had, already, he, he had neglected some of his family, but in the midst of all this important kingly duties, David was thoughtful. He remembered that he had a responsibility to give. He didn't just have good intentions. His love was proactive, and he sought... Mephibosheth, yes, out of his own. The same way Jesus sought us to seek and to save. So, ate at David's table. I really like, he's on point tonight. Like one of the king's sons. David had no agenda except for showing God's love. The crippled man had nothing to offer, yet he was treated like he was part of the family. So here's my closing statement right here. God has treated us not as guests, but as a part of the family. Amen. Lord, we're so thankful, God, that you allowed us to come here and do some study about David. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, that you've given this opportunity for us to open up the scriptures and let those words be very alive to us tonight. God, let us to not treat people as guests, but to treat them as family as you and David did. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I don't know if I should. I'm going to keep this going just in case we break out in like good conversation or something. But is there anything anybody want to Talk about, uh, Brother Jonathan, you doing a dissertation about David. He sent me some of his notes, and I was reading it, and I was like, man, I've already got, like, I've got all this. I'm just going to, I thought I was going to have too much, and I finished 20 minutes too soon. So I guess I could have used some of Brother Jonathan. Do you, anything you want to add? Because, you know, you, you're kind of a, a, a big wig. Uh, well, you're like a, a smarty person. I, Not a smarty pants, just a smarty person. Well, ju just on what you said about uh, shimmy eye. Yeah. Uh, the one that was cursing out David. Um, it, it's probable that Mordecai and Esther, he was a descendant of Shimei. So the guy that cursed out David ended up being, you know, so, something good came out of that fr from that man that would save the nation of Israel as as a people. Yeah. So, That's where I like to have those posters where you can see all that lineage of where. Yeah. There's a, little, there's a bad apple, but still something came good out of it. And so that was just so cool. Anything else? I mean, you got 18 minutes left. Well, I mean, and, well, I, I guess the, the big one is uh, the sword. So you, you read my thesis, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And that was, I mean, for my studies. Like that go, was go ahead and share them with them, the, the sword. Okay, so basically the, uh, the sword overall in, in the narrative, it's, it's not a good a good object to have uh, if you're if you're in, if you're in the study.
story because everybody who has a sword ends up dying by the sword in the story in, in the Samuel narrative. So, uh, but but with David, it's a little bit different. Um, he uh, he escapes the sword, but the sword never leaves his house. So, and you you see you see like. The beginning of the sword for David and the end of the sword and all this other stuff and it, it, it's okay so when David first arrives on the scene and like after his anointing he has power over the, the spiritual realm with his music playing and then after he uh, cuts off Eli's head with the sword he ends up you know well, later on he, doesn't have that ability anymore with King Saul, like the the demons don't, you know <coughs> Saul is basically angered more after you know, with, with the music playing and tries to kill David um, and I think it's pretty sad that, you know, you don't read about David, you know, playing music anymore uh, after killing Goliath, but uh you just see like all these sim similar things, and you see the dialogue with the sword. Uh, you know, David even goes back to the priest of Nob, and uh, he's going, "Do you have any weapons or anything like that for me?" And the priest they say, "All we have is the last sword." And so David says, "Give it to me. You know that there's no other sword that I want." And in a way, he, he really got it in the end, so uh, it's not a good thing. Anybody have any other comments or anything like that? Well, I, I, I don't want to think about David, but um, <clears throat> I was just reacting to the book about David not too long ago, and um, what the author was pointing out was he was really, and you, you sort of you alluded to this, that he, he was, he's not a super... We sort of made him into the superhero, right? That He's not. It's like this comic book story that he kills. And he was really complex, and, and, and actually this author said he was in Israel, right, you know, getting his, his, his notes together, and this lady asked him what he was writing about, and he told her, and he like, she was like, why? Why would you write about him? But like she hated it. She was like, he was terrible. Yeah. And, and, and if you read, like, he was terrible. Yeah. He had some really bad, dark moments. He did some awful things. But he also had some moments where it was like rest, uh, he was restored. Like yeah. God restored him because he repented. And I think when one of the, my favorite things about David is there are moments uh, like in Sick Flag and uh, different places where he gets to the end of what he can do and he remembers to, to rely that he can just, he, he remembers his faith. He remembers to rely on God. And, yeah. and, and then God uses his terribleness to show his mercy yeah. and, and his strength. So. When, we, when we talk about the church, how the church should restore people when they, when they run off and do something, and I'm writing a sermon about that now, because I had focused on the prodigal son, right? And they come back, everyone always uses that story about restoring someone after they've done something silly, right? Well, then I'm, I'm doing this study, and I'm like, this guy was kind of <laughs> a little worse than the prodigal son, right? I mean, this guy's murdering people. He's committing adultery. I mean, he's I mean, he's sitting in someone's husband, the front line, until so the guy will die. I mean, he's you know, he's he's not all that cracked out to be as as like a good person. We talk about God just kept restoring him. God like Miss Ness, listen, you're just cursed. Get out. Like he never really restored. Like he didn't restore Adam and Eve. He just all right, you're out. You know, I mean, of course, that's probably a different. That's a little different, but you know. It, God just kept restoring him because he kept repenting. And, he, you know, and talk about if we could do that as Christians, just as a whole, not just apostolic faith, just when someone does something and they either leave the church or they commit, you know, a sin, if we could restore them through repentance and get them back on track, you know, after God's own heart, you know, that's, that's, that would be great. Because, I mean, he just kept restoring David and kept restoring David. And, and David was king for like 40 years. Well, well, Died when he was, David, was yeah. God. It was about God, but he, God yeah, when he would go one way, he'd repent, turn back, and go back towards God, and so um, um, Erica found, we were talking about, because her and I were talking about the posters and the timelines of when we were in that store, and I think they went out of business, too, so I think this year, now that when we go down there, that store's probably going to be closed, 
But uh, I was wanting to show this. I tried printing it off, and apparently I'm not very smart when it comes to printing off. So, because this is actually bigger than a paper. So, I put a timeline of David's life all on there. And uh, I just thought it was thought it was intriguing. Sorry, I'm not trying to see it good. So, um, does it come? Does it look like a symbol of some sort? No, no. I think they were just they were just trying to put a timeline together. You know, when he was born, and all the way until you know he he passed away at seventy, just an old age, right? And so uh, I tried to print that off today. I don't know they got copies, and when I did it, it cut off part of the page. So I was like, well, I wasn't very good at that. So. Uh, I thought that was neat. So, 30 years old when he became king of Judah. I just thought that was just intriguing. So, and then we was doing some other some other studying. Uh, what was it? First Chronicles, I believe it was, chapter three. Found out they had 19 sons. My goodness, 19 sons, and he was 70. Brad, he didn't live till 800. That 70. Well, yeah, that we know of, and he had like eight wives that we know of, and many concubines, and oh, it was just like really weird. And of course, I'm sure he had daughters. How do you have 19 sons and not have daughters? I'm sure he had daughters. Well, I know we had one that we know of, but I'm sure he had. What I'm saying is, I'm sure we, he had more than that. They're just not mentioned. Um, but he had eight wives before he uh, uh, before he moved to Jerusalem. So um, and he already had a big family. So. Um, yeah, and David's life is just, it's like, it's like good, and there's like a really bad road of just bad, and then it goes good again, and then, so, um, yeah, so I'm not very good at closing these things out, but uh, I think we could look back on, we always point out David in a sermon, well, you know, or, or David, Job, well, Job went through this, like, well, Job was, you know, he was living different than David. You know, we can look back and say, listen, David was, yeah, he killed Goliath as a kid, but man, this this guy, he had it figured out, and then he didn't have it figured out, and then he'd figure it out, and then he, I mean, he's he's a lot like us. I mean, so. Um, well, and I think another good thing to point out would be that when he messed up with Bathsheba, the prophet came yeah. to him, and instead of ignoring the prophet, he took it to heart. And I think that that helps shows us that we need to have a pastor in our life that we listen to when things get rough. Mm -hmm. We need to listen to our pastor. And this, this David was just very human natured. I don't think the king thing went to his head too much. It probably did at times, but I mean, when he lost his kid, I mean, he just he sobbed like a father would sob for his for his child. I mean, he was I mean he was very human, and so. Um, I don't think it was, I don't think the kingship thing went to his mind so much. It's like, well, just look at, like, he wasn't like a Nebuchadnezzar, you know. You're going to bow to me, you know, Hebrew boys, you know. He wasn't like that. I think he was, he was a much different king.